Hello. In the last lecture, we stressed some fundamental common features of colonial rule in Africa. Let's review them very quickly. Economically, colonies were expected to pay for themselves and to contribute to the economic health of the mother country, primarily through the intensification of export production. Politically, all the colonies were run on authoritarian top-down lines though there was scope for the creativeness of the so-called man on the spot, and there were numerous roles assigned to various functionaries drawn from the subject population. Culturally, the colonies all saw the institutionalization of white supremacy and the establishment of the Western model of civilization as the model. Flowing from this was the great importance of Western-style education, and another commonality between the colonies was that this was in the hands, largely, of Christian missionaries. In this lecture, let us add some subtlety to this portrait of the colonial period in Africa by describing some important variations, both variations over space that is, between different colonies, between different colonial systems, and variations over time. That is, by observing how some of the systems, in particular, changed, especially during and after the Second World War. Now, I suggested last time that all empires in Africa, probably all empires anywhere, made use of various functionaries drawn from the subject population. In Africa, besides the African soldiers, the African police, the African clerks, the most important such figures were the ubiquitous chiefs. However, there certainly were important variations, significant variations, at least of degree, in the positions of chiefs or of kings, of headmen, between the different African empires. To the British, the key to maintaining order, and thus to orderly progress, lay in preserving a functional tribal system, as they put it. As one author has, has said, the British were particularly concerned to construct what he calls tribal boxes in which to contain, as it were, their diverse and multi-ethnic populations. This emphasis on the tribal system implied, of course, supporting a tribal authority structure. It was Lord Frederick Lugard who elevated this idea of indirect rule, and spelled with capitals here, it's a capital I and a capital R. Lugard who elevated indirect rule to an influential theory of benevolent imperial administration. He did so primarily in his 1922 book, The Dual Mandate in Tropical Africa, the dual mandate representing uh, the notion that, yes, we're here for ourselves, but also uh, to improve and allow for progress amongst our colonized populations, hence the idea of benevolent imperial administration in his view. Now, Lugard's experience was largely in Uganda and especially in northern Nigeria. These are two places with elaborate royalties, with state structures, with bureaucracies, which long predate the colonial imposition. In northern Nigeria, still today, we find enormous influence still wielded by the caliphs, the, the heads of the, the caliphates, the emirs, these very um, Islamic-flavored uh, systems of statecraft and, and administration created at various times in preceding centuries uh, in that savanna belt. Here is where Lugard had his principal experience in Africa and where he forged a system which worked fairly efficiently in a place like northern Nigeria as it did in some parts of Uganda. Elsewhere, in the British Empire, despite this eventual devotion to indirect rule, in places where authority was more diffuse, where it was more elusive, indirect rule uh, was more problematic. 
In the extreme case where we had what were in pre-colonial times uh, stateless societies, uh, it, it degenerated to an almost humorous kind of game of what we might call find the chief. I can illustrate this from my own research, which has been based in southern Zambia, the home to the, the so-called Tonga uh, peoples, the Tonga ethnic group. And the Tonga were an example of one of these traditionally acephalous, simply means headless or, or, or stateless peoples. They didn't have chiefs. They certainly didn't have kings. And in the early decades of the century, even before indirect rule gets elevated to, to a grand theory, uh, the British administrators were concerned nonetheless to, to find these authority figures in a culture which essentially did not have them. So you had scenes unfolding something like this. The district officers we've met in the last lecture going into a particular village, the center perhaps of a, of a neighborhood of six or eight villages and asking through his interpreter, who is often drawn from a different ethnic group, uh, group but happens to speak Chitonga, the local language, but perhaps not terribly well, asking him to ask the assembled people, who is your chief? Who is the chief? Now, the Tonga word today for, for chief is Mwami, M-W-A-M-I. As I say, often translated, if you ask someone for the translation of Wami today, you'll usually get chief and vice versa. But its original meaning actually was something closer to important person, big man. After all, because the Tonga didn't have institutionalized, formalized chiefs, it doesn't mean that they didn't have persons who, by dint of their personality, by dint of their ambition, their, their uh, power, their wealth, wielded more influence uh, than, than others. So the notion of the district officer asking who is your chief, but people hearing who are, who's an important person in this region, of course, there might be multiple answers to that question. Who is the Mwami? Who is the chief he thinks he's asking? They're hearing who's the important person here. Well, they might point to this one, might point to that one. They might, in fact, point to somebody who's actually not terribly important because they don't know what the implications of chiefship are going to be at that stage of the colonial game. Again, nobody has hindsight at this, at this point. Now, eventually, you know, this was not the, um, the shortcoming, uh, the intellectual shortcoming of the district officers to some extent. Many of these men had very little understanding or conception, how would they? Of, of stateless societies. They had grown up and were familiar only with state forms of organization. As the science of anthropology went forward and, and uh, analyses of, of stateless societies became uh, more available, in a lot of respects, the original error, if you like, in a place like the Tonga country was recognized. Let me quote from a district officer's journal written in 1936 in this very era, area I've been discussing, the Tonga region of southern Zambia. He said this, as is the general rule throughout the Mazabuka Plateau, that's the Tonga country or part of it, certain big men have been appointed chiefs by government who were not so recognized before the advent of the white man. In very many cases, owing to the size of the district and the non-existence of real chiefs, it was found necessary to pick out the most important man in a given area and call him a chief. In fact, this man was in most cases only primus inter pares, that is, the first among equals. And it is due to this fact that claims by other only slightly less important men are still being advanced three, three and a half decades into the colonial project. Now, the great anthropologist Elizabeth Colson, who was one of that group of, of, of anthropologists uh, I'm speaking of echoes the last sentence. She said that for every man who thus became a chief in this very region, there were probably 10 who had an equally valid claim, since they or their ancestors had also been recognized as leaders of small groups of villages or as ritual leaders. Now, this did not mean, however, this recognition of statelessness as, as the indigenous reality did not lead to a dismantling of the 
indirect rule structures. By the 1930s, they're such, uh, the British are so wedded to the notion of indirect rule that in fact, even by the very same officers I've just been quoting, we're seeing a strengthening of the structure of what they call the native authorities uh, at, that, at that point. Colson noted that at her time, which begins in the 1940s, that these chiefs, so-called, are accorded no particular respect or deference uh, more than, than anybody else. And indeed, the chiefs are still around. They've been uh, inherited in the, the era of independence, and I can assure you that I think that's still the case. No particular respect or deference given to what are seen as, essentially, the appointees of an alien system. Now, the other empires, to move us away from the British uh, indirect rule situation, the other empires in Africa, and I think this is true of most of, most of them, tended to take a, a more practical view of the need for African authority figures to serve as assistant rulers, if you like. And I, I think they took that view based uh, in a much more straightforward way on, on political expediency. In other words, they had an empire to run. They had a colony to run. And there wasn't this, this again, theorization, uh, such as Lugard and others in the British Empire uh, were, to, uh, were making of that, of that necessity. Now, in these other empires, in other words, in these other colonies, therefore, kings and, and chiefs were more likely to be supported or dismissed or appointed or even created based on a very straightforward evaluation of how helpful they were, how cooperative they were. Now, this was certainly known to happen in the British uh, Empire as well, in the British colonies uh, as well. The replacement of, as I noted in the last uh, lecture, the, the replacement of somebody who is proving to be a thorn in the side and proving to be, in the imperial view, a, a troublemaker with someone else. And that cer could certainly happen in the British colonies as well. It's a question of degree, it's a difference of degree, but it meant that there could be a difference in how far a particular chief or, or king could go in, in questioning, in opposing, in even defying a colonial government. And there was somewhat greater scope for that in the British Empire compared to the, to the others. Now, in some ways, the opposite side of the coin represented by the position of the traditional chief was the side of the coin represented by the educated native. I'm using a couple of uh, sort of key uh, phrases that come out of the colonial period. The relative sympathy accorded to these two types, if you will, was reversed in the French vis-a-vis -vis the British system. An underlying question here was basically this. How universal, how accessible was this thing called civilization? Were people, any people, including Africans, who acted in so-called civilized ways, according to their dress, their speech, their education, their income, if you like, were such persons entitled to equal rights to equal privileges? In theory, the French answered yes. Now, I say in theory, and that's indeed uh, a very important qualification, as many so-called black Frenchmen found out. If you read an account like Frantz Fanon's Black Skin, White Mask, now Fanon was from the West Indies, but he was certainly of African descent, uh, and his experience after indeed obtaining very high education, becoming a medical doctor, his experience colliding with the realities of continuing discrimination uh, against him inside uh, the, the French uh, Empire was a, a very jarring experience, and he portrays it um, very vividly in that, in that book. Nonetheless, there was in practice, beyond the theory, there was a greater scope for advancement through uh, the French policy of assimilation, of assimilation. Uh, in other words, different scope given to the so-called educated native here under the French system, different scope given to the so-called traditional chief under the British system. Questions and differences of degree, but nonetheless, they do affect the flavor of the colonial experience uh, 
for both the colonizer and the colonized in these, these empires. The British were far less enthusiastic about the so-called educated native, often suspected as a, as a troublemaker. And here's a, a telling indicator, I think, of this relative difference in, in degree. It was inconceivable in the British Empire that African representatives from the colonies would serve in the British Parliament uh, in London. It was not on. Yet in the French Parliament in Paris, beginning rather early in the century, uh, dozens of Africans from French West Africa, French Equatorial Africa, did in fact serve in the French Parliament. Often this was their sort of apprenticeship before returning and becoming part of the, the nationalist movement. So, uh, a difference there in the relative degree of mobility in this case, not the latitude given, but the longitude given, the ability to, to rise, uh, provided one, uh, indicated, gave proof of this uh, assimilation to, to the Western uh, mandated ideal. In the Portuguese Empire, we find a, a very pale reflection, uh, a faint echo of the, the French policy of assimilation. Um, the, the Portuguese called, called them assimilados, but if you look at the numbers of persons given the designation of assimilado and therefore, um, in theory, permitted uh, the same rights and privileges of a Portuguese citizen, such as they were. After all, Portugal was run by self-identified fascist uh, governments uh, for, for much of the 20th century. The number of assimilados in places like Angola or, or Mozambique was infinitesimal. It was a, a, a fraction, uh, well under 1% of the total population. And even many of these so-called assimilados were mestizos. They were persons of mixed African and Portuguese descent. One must be exceedingly wary, it seems to me, just to continue our, our range of, of comparisons. One must be quite wary in trying to assess, you know, degrees of oppression or degrees of brutality in the European empires in Africa. All of the empires were capable of appalling abuses. All of them have seen those abuses minimized or exaggerated at times, depending on the perspectives of the supporter or critic or activist or commentator uh, on the, the, the colonial situation. Having said that, in my view, it, almost, it also must be said that in Portuguese Africa, the intensity and longevity of forced cultivation, of forced labor, the burden of taxation, the survival of corporal punishment was, was notable in, in Portuguese Africa. But probably the most brutal regime of all, it didn't last long, uh, for a while was a colony which didn't belong to a nation at all, but personally to that nation's king. I'm speaking of the so-called Congo Free State, which was, until 1908, the personal possession of its proprietor, Belgian King Leopold II. We will examine the notorious episode of the Congo Free State in our later full lecture, lecture 25, on the Congo. Now, Germany had an African empire too, of course, but the German case immediately illustrates that colonial empires can change over time because it ceased to exist in 1918. To the victors of World War I went the spoils, and the German colonies, the possessions of one of the great losers in World War I, the German colonies were divided between the other colonial powers on the war's winning side through the mechanism of so-called League of Nations mandates. The League of Nations, of course, created only in the aftermath of 
the First World War, and the fledgling League uh, designated these mandates, these mandated territories, taking the World War I defeat of Germany as the mandate to assign various colonies to various of the Allied powers, so that Cameroon is divided between France and Britain. Togo goes to the French. Uh, Tanganyika in, in East Africa is assigned to, to, to Britain. Uh, Rwanda and Burundi uh, are taken from German colonial power and assigned to Belgium. This is after the period of, of the Congo Free State. Now there's one sort of uh, semi-exception to that pattern, and that is the German colony of Southwest Africa, now known as Namibia. Southwest Africa was mandated uh, and given over for, for administration to not one of the European uh, colonial powers, but to the recently formed Union of South Africa. And they stayed there until 1990. The German Empire did last long enough to ensure that the only major theater outside of, of Europe during World War I was in East Africa, in and around the German colony of Tanganyika. Now, for my money, the most vital distinction between colonies rested not on which nation owned which colony, but on a deceptively simple question. How many European, that is white, settlers came intending to stay? Now I emphasize intending to stay because there's a big difference between the district officer, the colonial governor, the army commander, the merchant, the missionary, in almost Every case those persons plan to go out to a colonial territory, spend a year or two or five or ten, in some cases twenty or more. But their ultimate objective is to retire back to the mother country, back to the, the, uh, the metropole. Settlers are a very different matter. They come intending to stay, intending for their children and children's children to stay, for their descendants to stay. Now, here we can enter a comparative note. Uh, if you take a longer view of colonialism, a place like Virginia or North Carolina or Pennsylvania or Massachusetts in an earlier phase of empire represented settler colonies, of course. Um, so I want to set up this dichotomy between settler colonies and non-settler colonies. Now, it's a useful distinction for reasons I hope to make clear, although, of course, it's also a spectrum. There's a range of situations depending on how many settlers we're talking about. A substantial number of settlers coming to stay makes it a settler colony, although it's a judgment call on substantial. Let me add right here that in none of the settler colonies, as I will designate them, did the European uh, transplanted populations become an actual majority. So there's a difference between the United States situation where, of course, European settlers did become the majority. In places uh, like South Africa even, or Algeria, it lies outside of our purview because it's in North Africa, but the places that sustained the greatest numbers of, of European settlers, even there, they were uh, greatly outnumbered by uh, the indigenous peoples. Now the settler colonies were concentrated in Southern and Eastern Africa, again, aside from Algeria. Uh, South Africa was clearly the granddaddy of the settler colonies in sub-Saharan Africa. It had the longest history, it had the deepest entrenchment of European settlers, and we've looked at that history in some previous um, lectures. Southern Rhodesia, Southwest Africa, Angola, Mozambique, these certainly qualify as settler colonies as I'm defining it. As to a lesser degree, do Kenya and northern Rhodesia. Those two are somewhat in the middle of that spectrum and on the, on the fence. Substantial number of, of white settlers, but not so many as the other cases I just, I just mentioned. Now, what difference did, did this make, this difference between settler and non-settler colonies? In day-to-day -day terms, the intensity and the frequency of what I can only call racial humiliations. The notion that, uh, as an African, I have to get off the sidewalk if I see a, a, a European, a white, coming toward me. That as an African, I have to go around to the side of the butcher shop and be handed the meat I want to purchase without being able to see it through a, a small hole cut in the side of, of the wall. 
these kinds of things in settler colonies, at least in the areas of within those settler colonies where the, the settler population was concentrated, these kinds of day-to-day -day humiliations uh, were multiplied. They were much greater than in the non-settler ones. Now, the demands for labor, uh, excuse me, were, were far greater and more intense. They were more constant. But this, in turn, rested partly on the greatest impact of settler versus non-settler of all. In settler colonies, people lost land. It's difficult to overestimate this consequence. And it's related to what I just said about uh, the, the demands for labor were greater. Of course, in settler colonies, there are more employers, uh, for one thing. But in settler colonies, after the colonial populations have lost land, they have very little alternative. They need wage employment because the alternative of production on their own land uh, is, is uh, an alternative which largely disappears with the appropriation of that land uh, by the settlers. So, without minimizing the impositions at all, the black man's burden, if I can put it that way, the burden uh, borne by ordinary Africans in colonial situations, the black man's burden in non-settler colonies was comparatively lighter. African residents of Nigeria or Togo or Uganda may have lost their freedom. They may have lost their sovereignty. But they did not lose their land. And that made a big difference. Finally, as we'll see in later lectures, the difference between settler and non-settler colonies will affect the decolonization process in very substantial ways as well. Now let's turn to bring our lecture to a conclusion to change or, or differences not across space but over time. It's common to divide the colonial period in Africa into three principal phases. The consolidation phase before World War I, the so-called high colonial period between the world wars, and the third era leading to colonialism's end beginning with the Second World War itself. Let me turn to this divide between the second and the third phase, between uh, or centering around the decade or so on either side of the Second World War. Uh, World War II affected Africa enormously. Something like a half million African soldiers served the Allied side overseas. They were critical in, in campaigns like Burma in, in Southern Asia. But beyond that, the mobilization required for critical war materials, stuff like copper, hastened urbanization. It meant that more and more people were drawn into these export nexuses. The cities, as one description of, in colonial southern Rhodesia said, the cities heaved and groaned under their human load of more and more people uh, producing more and more feverishly because of the, the intensification of, of the need for these things uh, during, during wartime. France and Britain, during the war and even after it, embarked on a substantially more serious uh, approach to development. There was a genuine increase in investment, in education, and in projects designed to benefit a wider range of the population. So to the soldiers, the administrators, the merchants, the missionaries, and in some cases the settlers, particularly after World War II in the French and British empires, we see the arrival more and more of the technician the engineer, the agricultural advisor, in other words, the experts becoming part of the colonial apparatus. Now, the motivations for them to take this turn towards what I will call the developmentalist state, the late colonial developmentalist state in the French and British empires, a term that I'll, I'll use again later in the course. The motivations for this varied. For in some respects, they owed and felt a, denu a genuine debt, a genuine gratitude. Charles de Gaulle, the leader of the French, uh, the Free French, felt genuine gratitude for the assistance given to him from French Equatorial and later in the war, French West Africa. But they made this turn toward reform, towards uh, making their their colonies more widely embracive of the notion of development. Of course, they'd always been interested in development of a certain kind, export development, for instance. But they make this turn partly, precisely to ameliorate what is a rising tide of discontent with uh, colonial, colonialism uh, itself. So it is, it is an effort at reform in order to preserve and to hang on to the colonies. Uh, at least in part. Now, this turn, this move towards the developmentalist state in the late colonial period 
uh, in the French and British empires. It has implications, and we will pursue some of those implications in, for instance, the dynamics of nationalism, the dynamics of decolonization, and indeed the creation of these developmentalist states in the late British and French colonial empires continues to have implications and consequences in the post-colonial states of today's Africa. Thank you.